My uh, great pleasure to introduce you the panelists today on uh, this uh, uh, topic, starting from my left, uh, Kalev Stoichesko, who is a former Estonian diplomat and now working as a senior researcher at the ICDS, Estonian Institute of Defence Studies. I have a Colonel Paul Clayton, who is the commanding officer of the British troops right now here, in, uh, stationed in Estonia within the NATO early forward presence. Uh, Marco Michelson, who is the vice chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Estonian Parliament, previously also chairman of the both Defence and Foreign Affairs Committee, and definitely, uh, last but not least, uh, Anu Estlas, who has worked a long, long time for Estonian defence industry cluster, but now is working for something totally different, uh, or maybe not so different, uh, for uh, Estonian renewable energy sector. Uh, she's the CEO of the Estonian Wind uh, Energy uh, Association. But uh, without you know, much kind of introductory remarks, I think the topic is important, I think the future of NATO, because for many, many, particularly young people in Estonia, I get the feeling that you know, NATO has been all the time there, it's something you know, given, but, but as with many other things in life, that may not be the case, actually. All the NATO allies, organization itself has to work hard to you know, stay alive and uh, remain uh, relevant in, in this uh, business. And uh, just sort of to warm up our debate and, and discussion, I would ask each panelist for a really you know, quick, short comment, maybe a minute or two, and then we will come back for a longer debate. So, Marco, I'd like to start with you. If you look at the current stage of the play within the NATO, how you would assess what is the state of play, what is the kind of the health check or the condition of the NATO at uh, 70? Is it in a good shape or something, uh, something needs to be done? So, can you comment on that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dali. Uh for this uh, good question. Actually, uh, for organization uh, which has uh, uh, been together for 70 years, uh, actually, uh, my uh, understanding is that uh, the health is pretty good. Uh, it's like a new middle, uh, how to say, middle age uh, situation. 70 is new 50, right? <laughs> 70 is new 50, or new 30. Uh, uh, but uh, and and uh, actually the reason why uh, NATO is uh, so important not only for Estonia because when we're talking about uh, NATO's future we're talking about Estonia's future because this is uh, so much uh, 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 the essence of our uh, uh, defense and uh, security identity. Uh, but also the reason why NATO is so much needed is is uh, strongly there and we see and hear almost daily. Uh, across the border uh, to the east from us, uh, why NATO is uh, important not only for us but uh, for all members. Yeah, thank you for that. Kalev, if I may continue with you from here, what would be from your perspective top three concerns in your mind when we talk about the future of NATO, let's say within the next five to ten years? Mark already hinted or pointed to one threat, but what might be some other, you know, the top concerns in your mind? First, if I may compliment what uh, Marco said on the uh, state of NATO, health condition. I think at 70, NATO is a pensioner of defense and security in a wonderful shape because it has, first of all, it has good genes, mostly liberal democratic, I would say. Secondly, it has a clear mind and um, it has uh, strategies for the future. It's uh, intelligent and determined uh, because it uh, takes uh, decisions oriented to the future upon democratic consensus. I, I would emphasize the word democratic consensus because there might be also other forms of consensus to be achieved. And, and finally, because it has a very good athletic body. I mean, I speak about um, uh, military capabilities. And at 70, uh, the uh, member states have decided that obviously f for a pensioner in such a good shape, uh, there is no way to, to, to put this pensioner into a um, retirement home, but rather to build a new headquarters, a wonderful one in Brussels. So that's where it is. And I think that symbolizes that NATO has a great uh, future. But about the challenges, I would very, in a very telegramic way mention them because there are challenges regarding the burden sharing and spending more money and not only spending more money on defense, but spending wisely. 
Uh, it's very important to see what, not only how much we spend, but what we get from that money that we spend on defense. And to also look at certain political discrepancies that uh, we might have seen, for instance, in early 2000s around Iraq. We may have them now around Iran, another country in that region. So there are things that we shouldn't be shy not to discuss about and to look looking into the future. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks for listing uh, some of them. And, and definitely we'll come back in more detail also later, later on on this panel. Uh, Paul, or, or Colonel Clayton, you have been here with the British uh, troops since spring, April. Uh, this year, and we are really, really happy to see I mean, the British troops uh, stationed in Estonia to give all the reassurance and, and deterrence. But within your uh, few months uh, here in charge of this uh, operation from the UK side, how do you assess? Is your size and shape, uh, I mean, adequate to the mission and the task and the threats here? Or what's, what's your take on this? Is it okay? Or do you miss something? Uh, thank you. It's an interesting question. I think, first of all, I think our presence here just by itself uh, is a really big statement uh, against the threat that's being discussed from across the border. I think it shows the cohesion of NATO, and it's not just here in Estonia, but it's also in Latvia, Lithuania, and across down into Poland. And that, that show of force from a number of NATO allies with our friends here in the Baltics and Poland uh, is really strong. And so the size of our force could be argued that of one battle group, what difference does that make? Um, but it's our presence here and showing standing form with the, the Estonian Defence Forces that is, is really the important part. Thank you. Anu, and turning to you, with in particular trying to use your vast, vast experience, you know, from the defence industry side, and, uh, and, and I think people here should not be surprised, actually. It's, you know, the growing sector within the Estonian uh, economy. But looking more at the broader and the global picture. I think in the past it has been that a lot of you know, the innovation has come out from you know, the military sector, but these days when you look at you know, all the digital stuff, you know, artificial intelligence, is it correct that actually more that we see more you know, innovation these days coming you know, from the private sector and it's led by the private sector? Or is that correct description of the picture or how would you describe it? Yeah, thank you. Uh, indeed, it's, uh, it's absolutely the way that the civil side, the technology is coming from there and then the military have to adapt. And I think that one of the challenges, what was um, you know, many times mentioned here also, is that, uh, that we have to adapt. We have to adapt economically, technology-wise, but also politically. So it's, it's the change, constant change going on. So, and, and indeed, as previously it had been that the military had been the basis of the, of the innovation and now vice versa. So it means more cooperation uh, between industry, uh, between military, between uh, political people and, and everybody else. So basically what, what needs to be done, I think, uh, is uh, more cooperation, more talks, uh, lots of active involvement and trying to understand each other's needs and possibilities. I hope it's not artificial fly, which is flying there, but it's a... It's a <laughs> okay, thank you very much for this you know, excellent opening uh, remarks. And now I think we have a chance to dwell on, on a little bit more on, on these different threats. And Marco, I think one of the issues, I think Kalev mentioned, or you yourself, but I think one of the key issues for the NATO's future is probably political cohesiveness of the alliance. And when we look back at the history of the you know, alliance, I think the situation where we are today, when there might be some fractions, within the alliance. It's nothing new. I think alliance in the history has faced probably even bigger crisis challenges, I don't know, from the Suez to Iraq and, 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 uh, and others. But you as a politician, I mean, how you would uh, look on this, on this uh, challenge? Is it mainly coming from the, uh, you know, over the Atlantic because of the finances? Do you see there are other issues, rifts? I mean, I think the Turkey has been very much up in the debate lately with their, some, you know, the purchases. So could you a little bit elaborate on this, you know, political cohesiveness and, and where things stand and what might be the threats in the future here? This is a very good question. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> very, very difficult to, to give a to kind of short answer, but uh, let's say, um, as far as I understand, on professional level, uh, the cooperation among NATO countries uh, works pretty well, uh, taking into account all these uh, challenges coming within you uh, mentioned uh, in your question. But uh, let's say my experience uh, 
working in uh, NATO Parliamentary Assembly for the last uh, nine, eight years uh, tells me that uh, what happened, sp sp especially since 2014, has been quite a turning point uh, among our allies. Uh, understanding uh, more commonly the existing threats coming from East, uh, which is actually existential threat to organization called NATO, uh, made us uh, uh, more united uh, than uh, earlier talks about need to share the burden and uh, do this and that. And, uh, and I tell you that, yes, we had few moments with our Turkish colleagues, we had few moments between Americans and Germans and uh, and few other episodes, but uh, I mean, on a level of uh, sort of parliamentary uh, sc scrutiny process, what we what the NATO Parliamentary Assembly does, but it's uh, end of the day that there is no doubt about uh, the need uh, to strengthen cooperation in all levels and uh, in all areas. What was mentioned uh, already here. But uh, we must understand that, uh, okay, the world is changing, uh, the situation in both in Europe and in Northern America is uh, poli in political uh, landscape uh, a bit different than we used to see for maybe last 70 years. And there is a force uh, which also um, uses the moment and actually uh, tries to expand uh, division lines. Uh, within societies, within uh, our member states, but also between uh, uh, member states. So we have to uh, be fully uh, uh, aware of, uh, of this challenge as well. And, uh, and, uh, and this is what I have seen closely debating with our, uh, my colleagues uh, uh, from other uh, NATO parliaments. Uh, their understanding and awareness is much better today than maybe five or ten years ago. But are you also worried about kind of the internal cohesiveness? I mean, having in mind here, you know, some of the internal political developments within different countries. I mean, it's also quite often you know, referred to in the public political debate that, that, you know, first time in the NATO's history, I mean, the question of, you know, the, the domestic processes, I mean, are asked, I mean, within the alliance, but obviously NATO is not an organization addressing those issues, there are other organizations, but, but are, you, are you worried, does it, do you feel that's the relevant? Well, average Estonian is always worried, uh, so, uh, but uh, we must be as optimistic as we see the weather uh, above us today here in uh, Paide. Uh, we had huge storm, black clouds, and this is something you could see also uh, on a horizon of, uh, of NATO, or NATO's future, but I believe that taking into account what is going on in the a, in a, in a world today, uh, the challenge also posed by China, for instance, or uh, from uh, ongoing troubles in, in the Middle East and uh, how to keep up uh, vital sea lines and, uh, and so on and so forth. There are so many actually uh, sort of uh, problems to tackle which uh, can be done uh, in the best possible way only in, in a good alliance. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Kalev, if I may follow it with you, talking about you know, these external threats and the challenges, isn't it also true that you know, over the years they have become you know, more and more you know, the complex and difficult? They are not you know, the linear, just you know, one-dimensional, but you have you know, it's many, many faceted you know, the issues. And when we also talk about you know, security issues surrounding us in this region, I think that's maybe you know, a good example, that it's not only the you know, very linear or the one-dimensional, but, uh, but quite complex of its own nature. Uh, would you agree with that, or how you would describe this issue? Yes, thank you. I, I think the biggest challenge now are these flies here on, on, <laughs> on the scene, but I hope to get rid of them soon. But um, yes, indeed, I mean, the, the very basic building block of the Alliance has always been a common threat assessment. And uh, threat perceptions, which is different from the common threat assessment in many ways, are, are different. I mean, um, you know, the closer you are to the North Pole, the colder you feel, right? And the further away you are, the warmer it is. So the closer you are to Russia, probably the more you feel threatened because of Russia's policies, because of your history, your geography and all that, especially being a small country like, like this. So, but, and then you have the countries on the southern rim of the alliance, 
uh, on the Mediterranean. They face other challenges, uh, migration, etc. And but then we come uh, at 29 uh, around the table in in Brussels at the HQ, and we agree, in spite of these different threat perceptions, on a common threat assessment. And that is the very basis of, of, of what we do. And it's good to have countries engaged. How many countries are now in the FP? More than 20, I, I believe, of, of the 29. So it shows that these concerns of ours are, are shared, that there is an understanding of how Russia behaves. I mean, I wouldn't hesitate, for instance, to, to, make, to draw some historic parallels between uh, what Soviet Union in the Warsaw Pact did um, in Hungary, 1956, in Czechoslovakia, 1968, with Georgia, 2008, and Ukraine since 2014. It's the very same predatory killer instinct, if you want, to react, to, to try to defend its own zone, so to say, and, and so on. And I mean, these acts have been very clear for us, and we have reacted uh, swiftly because NATO is a huge machinery and usually, you know, the, the flower is grinded, as we say, uh, months and years and so on, but these decisions to, to take certain measures to deploy troops here and, and to come back effectively to, to collective defense, this, this has been done in a, in a formidable, very, very swift uh, way. Uh, thank you. Uh, Colonel, I think this, you know, the deployment of you know, the uh, battle group, the NATO battle group here in Estonia, is, is you know, one good example of you know, the NATO's very swift, rapid reaction to you know, the changing security uh, environment. And, and what would be your key takes or the lessons from this uh, deployed mission uh, here, you know, as long as it has been uh, now? I mean, and I understand there is no kind of the end date or the exit strategy yet. It may or should evolve. As, as necessary, but, but maybe also from the British or the UK perspective, that what are the key, key, key valued points from, from, from mission here? Uh, I, I think uh, there's a number of, of key takeaways. I think, first of all, on sort of talking through where we are as far as threat perceptions, I think our threat perception is, is very much woken up in the sort of further Western elements of, of Europe um, following the actions that, as you said, in, in, in 2014 in, in Crimea. And after having a, a period where we were very much focused on the Middle East, I think a lot of uh, our European allies have now absolutely started looking east a little bit more to the threat over, over the border. Um, and that has been sort of the, really shown in a number of ways. One is uh, the deployment of EFP here um, across to the, the Baltics. But the other one is the increase of readiness within our standing forces within uh, Europe. Uh, I think it would be quite right to say that uh, we probably took our eye off the ball when it came down to our ability to be able to deploy a force in a timely manner to be able to come uh, and face a threat. And I, I think in the last uh, two or three years, most of the allied countries within Europe and NATO have, uh, have absolutely looked to change that and increase the readiness of our forces. Here in, in Estonia, I think uh, there are a number of challenges, as you'd expect. Interoperability is one thing that within NATO, you know, 29 states, 29 different ways of communicating, 29 different ways of, be, of uh, fighting vehicles, etc. And trying to get all of those online and being able to, to cooperate and train uh, it's, is challenging. But the way that we overcome that is by taking part in joint training exercises, going through uh, seminars and discussions in order to be able to understand where those problems are, those fault lines are, and then try and come up with solutions to be able to remedy them. Um, and here in Estonia, we, you know, we speak on different radios, but we still are absolutely integrated in with the 1st Estonian Brigade uh, and are able to cooperate with them. And Exercise Spring Storm this year was a prime example of, of us as a battle group being able to work with the Estonian Defence Force uh, in a really, really effective manner. Thank you. Uh, Arno, turning to, to you and, and, and uh, again talking a bit more about you know, the industry uh, side, probably one of the areas which has been sort of you know, pointed out most often you know, in critical terms about cooperation within the NATO is actually on the, on the defense industry side and particularly on the European side that you know, we're you know, quite uh, fragmented. It's not only an issue about you know, the defense investment. So what are the latest developments there and what is your prediction for the next five, ten years to come? I mean, we, do we Europeans become better on this or how do you see? 
Yeah, excellent questions indeed. And I think I should need another two hour session just to answer to that questions. But um, first of all, I will go a little bit back because the reason why I'm here, I think mostly is that I have been the head of delegation of NATO Industry Advisor Group. So uh, five years uh, sitting around with the 28, 29 country representative uh, from all NATO members. And NIAG is, just as everybody knows, is a normal NATO body. Uh, it's giving uh, industry advice to national armaments directors. and. Um, giving the, you know, their thoughts and perspective on future capabilities, what is possible, with what cost and what level. So this is one of the things what I was working every day to bring the Estonian industry knowledge to NATO members and via that shaping up the members, uh, armed forces and, and providing future perspectives. Another thing I have to mention, just so everybody knows, that everything happens there pre-commercial. So there is no discussion about the possible products, so-called, but rather the trends and, and, and um, the visions, so-called. And this is exactly what, um, what our British colleagues are saying, that we have to find common solutions and, and ways to cooperate and, and indeed uh, to change the fragmentation in Europe. Uh, I was one of the lucky ones because I was also working for uh, or with the uh, European Defence Agency, uh, where the Defence Fund was created and so on and so forth. So, Indeed, the industry in Europe is fragmented much more than in the US. Uh, I'm quite honest on that. Um, I have been in exercises uh, where you know, small equipment doesn't work with other units, so, and it having a delays on, on training and, and uh, mission accomplished and so on and so forth. I'm quite positive. Uh, at least I can see that the industry is consolidating. They are trying to find themselves ways uh, and as, as also a NIAG representative, I, I can see that we are the job what uh, the, the NIAG is doing and the advice they are giving, uh, the common understanding the future needs are, are there. So we are making the customer a little bit smarter, uh, a little bit thinking ahead, uh, trying to offer a little bit more um, effective uh, and uh, more reasonable solutions. Because always you can, you know, wish the dream equipment and then you realize how much it costs and then you're saying, okay, maybe I don't really want that. At least I don't want to pay for that. Um, and, and, and so on and so forth. So I, I personally see that things are changing heavily, especially in Europe, defense fund, the new projects, equipments, the consolidation in the industry-wise is happening. Um, I can see that also the army is becoming more and more open-minded and trying to, you know, taking the equipment in, uh, Ex, you know, examining things, especially Estonians, of course, uh, how, what benefits the new equipment can provide. And I think the trust between the industry and, and the armed forces and politicians are becoming better and better also. So the trend there uh, is, is really positive. And, and I think that um, the more we work together, the more positive, you know, cooperation possibilities we have, the better results we will be in the future. Thank you, and, and thank you for pointing out that actually it's again some you know many faceted issues. Not only about you know, the investment or the money as such, but also the interoperability and you know the other issues there. But I think probably we cannot do without still discussing about this you know money side or the investment side because that's a you know, big issue debate within the NATO that how much allies do or do not invest into the uh, for the defence uh, purposes. And I found actually a very nice quote from uh, from one of the U.S. presidents, namely I'm quoting that we cannot continue to pay for the military protection of Europe while the NATO states are not paying their fair share. We have been very generous to Europe and it is now time for us to look out for ourselves. It sounds like maybe, I don't know, President Trump, but actually it's not. It's coming more than 60 years or 50 years back from the President Kennedy. And Marco, how would you describe the situation with this you know, investment side? I know it's, I mean, you are also a member of the parliament and also approved the defense and the, you know, the state budget here. Well, it's not, has been at least uh, for a long, long time, not a big issue here. But if you look particularly the other Western European bigger countries, so that's a really a difficult domestic issue. I mean, how do we get, you know, European countries around? Actually, this uh, topic is one of the probably fewest nowadays in Estonian internal politics which uh, uh, enjoys a uh, rather strong consensus. Uh, we don't, uh, there is no political force in Estonia who uh, 
uh, puts into question uh, the expenditure level, level to, uh, to defense, what we have at the moment, 2.2% of, uh, of GDP. Uh, there is probably discussion goes in a way that how much more we have to add up uh, to this. But uh, uh, this, uh, actually, the two points. Uh, what Anu said actually put me to think about uh, uh, how important actually NATO is to put lim limits to this so-called sovereignty rally. I mean, you know, all these kind of uh, trends we see mostly in Europe, but somehow also in the United States, polarization uh, uh, of societies and kind of uh, call for more nationalistic uh, uh, priorities and policies and protectionism. Then at the same time, uh, development in the area of uh, defense uh, industry, but also not only industry, but uh, having these uh, common challenges uh, we mentioned earlier, uh, actually put serious limits, uh, in my understanding, to, uh, to those who would like to see more stronger borders between uh, NATO allies. But uh, back to uh, the investment uh, question, uh, I... Uh, I still understand uh, when I talk to my colleagues from uh, uh, several European uh, NATO member states uh, about uh, why the levels of, uh, of defense, exp defense expenditures stay at 1.1, 1 1.23% 1 uh, uh, is that uh, it's not only that there is no, let's say, m real uh, political perhaps will to do this. Uh, uh, but uh, there is still lack of uh, uh, awareness among public, which is actually a vicious circle that politicians are not uh, talking to people in a way that why we need actually to put uh, more money into defense and what are their serious challenges. If you compare to times like Kennedy talked about uh, uh, then every single, no, let's say not every single person, but uh, the, the threat from uh, Soviet Union that time was uh, clear and uh, visible for, for many uh, in Europe. Today, if you go uh, further west from Estonia, uh, the less it's a so -called kind of immediate threat feeling uh, is among uh, voters. And for politicians, it's much more difficult to tell that, okay, why don't we put money into, I don't know, health healthcare, uh, uh, pension system, uh, social uh, care, and so on and so forth, and, but, but into the defense. And this is something what, what we have seen, at, uh, what has helped uh, turning around this thinking, unfortunately, is that somehow somebody has to pay by uh, their lives and uh, catastrophic uh, outcome of uh, our current situation, what we see, unfortunately, in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. Before opening up our debate also and to include you and to take the questions from the audience, Paul, I still would like to ask from you one question and, and please don't go into too much you know, of the technical details, but, but I see also in one of the, you know, the big, big value in NATO, the backbone actually is also the, you know, the military structure, the integrated command structure, how you know, NATO nations are able to generate you know, jointly you know, the necessary force for the missions, deployments, I mean, we have all these structures in place, interoperability, et cetera, et cetera. But how do you see, I mean, how this backbone, is, is that also in a good shape for the, you know, the organization, you know, aged, you know, in the new middle age, so to say, or do you see the need for some improvements also there that, or is it just a matter of political will that, you know, the, either the allies provide the troops or not, or do you see that something needs to be done also on this, on this side? I think it's in a really healthy state at the moment. The, uh, the exercise regime that's going on uh, across Europe with NATO and uh, all of the allies within NATO has increased dramatically uh, over the last couple of years. And that is taking part on a number of scales. One is the higher level headquarters exercises, talking through the, the way that we go through the mechanisms and how we would potentially have to deploy and what are the, the right go, no-go areas, etc. 
Uh, but all the way down to tactical exercises where we've got more and more forces deploying together on the ground and exercising together. So I, I think that's, that's been really impressive over the last couple of years. The other thing is that NATO is adapting in, it, in its way of, of generating some new headquarters where it's seen gaps. It's, it's identified that and tried to plug those and is growing and uh, other areas of cyber for example and looking out into other threat regions rather than being in what would be maybe the more traditional threats that we would have seen maybe 40 or 50 years ago okay yes of course yes please as a, as very briefly no more than 15 minutes 15 minutes right <laughs> no um ju just an idea that i came with uh, having listened to you all um is that the future of nato as i see it is um it depends more and more on the Europeans, so it's more and more in, in European hands right now. Obviously, the United States remains uh, and will always be uh, our biggest ally, uh, which uh, obviously without the United States there will be no NATO in that sense, but the Europeans have to do much, much more than they've done. And um, spending 2% uh, at least, which is the minimal, not the maximum uh, requirement on defense, um, makes uh, there are some difficulties, uh, as you, Marco, said, in, in certain countries. Having spoken with people from Germany, from France, from other uh, France actually fulfills that criteria, but Germany and other countries. Uh, but I said that this is a common pledge we have taken in Warsaw, right, uh, at the summit in 2016. And it shouldn't be, in that sense, treated politically, internally, that this is a requirement by, by President Trump or, or, or pressure from him. This is something that we consensually agreed upon and must be uh, uh, fulfilled. And uh, one more thought perhaps is about the European Union and that is uh, the other side of the coin if you look from our side. And, and uh, well, um, I mean the future of NATO per se does not depend on how healthy or unhealthy in a way the European Union will be, but we see that the European Union gets more and more involved in the defense dimension and also NATO benefits from it. Let me, for instance, mention the military mobility um, uh, initiative. This is real money, real projects, real infrastructure that is gone and this is good for NATO and moving troops and so on. So, and uh, I think this aspect should be also be taken into consideration. Thank you. Yeah, good. Thank you for your comments on this as well. Okay, I think it's the uh, right time to open up uh, uh, our debate also for the questions from the audience. I think the whole purpose, I think, of this session is not that you know a few people come together and discuss among themselves, but actually this is a good opportunity to express your views, ask questions. So please raise the hand. We have a microphone. Please use the microphone. Uh, tell your name and to whom your question is addressed. I see the young gentleman over there. So. Mina ingliskeelt küll ei oska, aga mul on küsim nagu sõna see ära kolonelile. Kuidas ta näeb NATO-t 50 aasta pärast? Kas ta loodab, et NATO on näikäks ühinenud palju riike või äkki isegi kõik võimas Venema? The young gentleman is apologizing that he doesn't speak very well English, but the question is to you, kolonel, that how do you see the future of NATO with the next 50 years, has it uh, enlarged and maybe even uh, a big neighbor, Russia, has joined NATO by that time? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I suppose it, it very much, as we've talked about threats, it depends on what the threat is. You know, when, we, when the Cold War finished, or the, you know, what could be maybe described as the first Cold War, finished um, we're, we were in a situation where NATO was, you know, what is the value of NATO, where does it stand? And that's where I was 25 years ago when I joined the army. I joined an army where NATO wasn't, although we were absolutely part of it, but it wasn't the sort of keystone. We've, we've done a number of different things in different areas since then. Um, but that's because our perception of the threat across the border was, was less. Um, as, as we stand at the moment, when we've still got an unpredictable uh, adversary, potentially, to the east, we need to maintain the same levels as we are at the moment and increase our cohesiveness and make sure that all of the allies are central and have got a, a focus. And that will continue in the next 50 years unless the problem uh, with our adversary changes. Yes, thank you. Please, more questions from the audience. So raise your hand and the mic can move. 
move to you. While you are thinking about the next question, I'd like to ask, uh, and maybe actually this question is, is all of you, so you're welcome to, to comment this. It's, it's, it's about NATO and China. I think we see in the global political debate you know, more and more discussions about you know, the uh, role and you know, the, uh, all kinds of issues you know, that China is, is posing us. It's you know, mainly you know, the economical, maybe less you know, the China vis-a-vis -vis Europe, more you know, US uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China. But while we see also the increasing investments you know, from China in, in Europe, I mean, through that maybe also the larger political influence on the developments uh, here. How do you see, and Marco, maybe to start with you, how do you see, I mean, how much NATO, for example, shall deal with, with you know, issues related to China at all? Or shall we leave this for the US only? Or because when I just, you know, trying to think, or you know, looking ahead, I mean, the US obviously also needs more resources to deal, you know, with issues in the, in the Asia, Asia Pacific. It has probably kind of structural impact on the relations within the alliance, but, but is it only purely economical or is it also the political military issue? So now you opened up a Pandora box, actually you really can go and uh, discuss this for next two or three hours easily. Uh, I just uh, will make a few remarks on that. I, I, uh, I was one of the first delegation of Parliamentary Assembly uh, NATO who visited China roughly ten years ago or so. And uh, they were quite surprised about our visit and uh, didn't, didn't know what to, to show us and uh, uh, how to talk about. But, uh, but this was actually at the time when uh, China and uh, NATO made the first kind of visible contact in, uh, in terms of uh, cooperation in, in the field of uh, military. And this happened in, uh, in Arden Strait uh, uh, during uh, operation against uh, piracy uh, there uh, to open up a uh, vital sea line uh, into and from uh, Red Sea. And, uh, and uh, we know that since then uh, China has been uh, actively expanding, expanding its military presence globally. Uh, but what was interesting, a uh, couple of months ago, this uh, springtime I uh, visited with my colleagues uh, uh, Hawaii and uh, we got full briefing from uh, US uh, Indo-Pacific Command. Admiral Davidson made us uh, uh, perfect, uh, sort of uh, painted a picture about uh, not only current situation but about the future. What that tells me is that uh, we are heading into quite uh, rough territory in relations between um, uh, China and the United States. Uh, the growth of the uh, Chinese, Chinese military cap capabilities in uh, uh, not only closer to their uh, shores, uh, but also their ambition to become uh, uh, master of uh, blue waters by 2040, at least in Pacific, makes it, uh, gives us clear message uh, and, and this goes uh, along with uh, what uh, Carla uh, mentioned earlier, that European nations must understand that uh, the threat posed by Russia to us could be uh, there for many years, more than 50 years, I can imagine, maybe, maybe, and if I'm wrong, uh, thank God, but, uh, but there is also a similar, similar threat in terms of uh, uh, of uh, China, China-US cooperation, or China-US you know, possible clash as well, and first and foremost around uh, Taiwan, around uh, South China Sea and, uh, and these areas. And that may, uh, makes me think that uh, the US could be in the future much more involved in Asia Pacific, uh, and uh, we have to uh, take more care about uh, we Europeans, uh, what's what's happening here in uh, in in our continent? Kalev, do you see a role for NATO, larger role of NATO in Asia? In 50 years? Or? Why not? <laughs> well, first of all, NATO is a collective defense um, organization. We do have uh, certain out of area operations in certain areas. We've been in Afghanistan, in, in etc. But we should stick to some sort of, you know, um, understanding some geography and so on. It, I would see that that um, China could become a challenge 
to, to, to NATO, to the Allies, if China comes closer to us, not we going closer to them in that sense. So if the Chinese presence uh, in Africa, for instance, becomes also military, for instance, and, and it will start directly challenging the interests of certain European allies and so on, then, then we might have a problem in that sense. The challenges are more now indeed in the Pacific and the Indian Oceans, perhaps. And there, there are ways to cooperate, as, as Mark outlined. So um, in that sense, I, I, I don't see China now. If there wasn't a joke in the old Soviet times that uh, we, we should hope of having peace at the Estonian-Chinese border, but <laughs> they won't come that close to us. But, but, um, but um, I mean, um, uh, China is expanding militarily, as you said. So, and and uh, they might have a future role in the Middle East, in the Gulf, etc. Which, I mean, the, for us, we have a challenge from Russia because it's not just our neighbor to the east, but because Russia is present militarily and active in Syria, in down to Venezuela, if we wish. So, the Chinese are not or not yet. So that will depend very much on how active and how expansionist the Chinese would be, not only commercially and economically, but also militarily. Thank you. Very quickly, actually, the, what Callum uh, said, that what is the main difference between China and, uh, and Russia in terms of challenge to us as NATO is that if Russia has quite specific strategy to undermine NATO's uh, efforts to be strong, united, and, uh, and present. Uh, the actual end game, anyway, is from Versailles is to dismantle NATO. Then uh, I haven't discovered yet the same will from Beijing. Yeah, and I would really just expand slightly on that. In, if you look historically, China has never really had an offensive posture uh, where they have started conflict outside. They've been very much defensive in nature, and that's where their armed forces have been focused. Um, but as they're taking on in the last 20 years a more global perspective, they've, they've looked at, they've had a strategy, they've expanded, as you said, uh, a lot more into the Middle East, into Europe, but also into Africa. Um, the same way as we would have done in the past, you have a, a need to be able to provide security for, for where you've put investment. And so it's understandable that they're looking to have a, a larger navy. Do I think it's going to be a larger navy with, uh, with an offensive posture? I don't think... At the moment, I'm not seeing it towards NATO. Uh, and I think that Pacific tilt that took part with uh, in America probably sort of three or four years ago where there was a large swing towards um, activity in the Pacific uh, and a need to sort of redirect some of their forces that way, uh, I've certainly seen more from the American side to be swinging a little bit more back towards Europe uh, in that. So we shall see how it develops. Yeah, I, I will just shortly comment about the technology-wise. Uh, of course, China is investing heavily on, on their equipment and, and technolo technology-wise. But on the other hand, also, I don't see at least, um, you know, allies' trust or industry trust to cooperate with them. As there is no political trust, there is no industry trust. So we go along with the general mentality, what our governments are thinking and, and, and wanting, so-called. So, -called. so um, their technology is way ahead. Um, quite often looking what we are doing and doing it better or cheaper or uh, and on their way. But on the other hand also, I, I don't see um, mutual cooperation in industry-wise because um, the difference is, is there and uh, we do what um, is best for our country, so-called. Good, thank you. Well, now is again your chance to ask some of the questions and please raise the hand who has any Questions, thoughts in mind, you can post to the panelists. Yes, please, madam. But just wait a sec so it, the microphone will come. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, as far as I see, the task of NATO is seen as defense. So against Russia, against China, and so on. But my question would be how far the task of NATO is seen in, uh, as well getting into contact and communication with those enemies. So 
maybe that is not only a joke that to imagine Russia as part of uh, NATO, but uh, at the moment, what what kinds of endeavors and efforts are done to uh, communicate on different levels? That would be my question. Yeah, thank you. I think that's this everlasting question about you know the dialogue and you know the deterrence you know in the in the alliance. So how is the balance? What's happening today? So, Kalev, maybe you could describe? Yeah, well, a historic fact is that um, the Soviet Union, uh, uh, in a way, applied for NATO membership in 1950 or something like that. So, and that was obviously a joke, a memoranda prepared by the foreign minister uh, Molotov, just to trick the Americans and all the NATO and so on. It was a kind of a trying to obviously, um, they, they didn't hope to have a positive reply to their so-called request, and so just to undermine NATO. And, um, but um, as concerns the dialogue, I mean, this is something that has never uh, been um, um, uh, excluded. I mean, even during the harshest times during the Cold War, there was always deterrence and containment of Russia and dialogue. So, and you have to keep channels open and to talk to them, even if this is uh, quite often futile. You don't get any any big results. This is done um, both at the NATO HQ, uh, even though the relations between NATO and Russia were frozen from 2014 for some time. Then, then there were again some meetings uh, at the NATO Russia Council. Um, and they also uh, individual allies uh, talk to Russia. I mean, even our president was there, um, and um, I, I don't think they were able to to decide on anything or do. But uh, maybe maybe this would help a bit, even if there are just contacts without uh, without agreeing on actually anything uh, with them. I think our main concern is that the Russia in spite of these uh, attempts to have some dialogue with them, uh, they do not show any, the, the slightest actually, sign of changing their policy. What we see is more and more escalation. Also on the military front, probably read the yesterday news and, and the day before, as they intend to open uh, helicopter bases on Sursar, an island that is in the Gulf of Finland there, to once again bring more forces, more closer to us, and uh, to, again to put missile systems uh, in the north there facing the Norwegian uh, radars uh, in Vardio and so on. So basically they, they continue to escalate all the time and Probably they would like to, I don't know, to suffocate us by showing their military might around us. And, and uh, it's always the dilemma how to deal with them, because if you want to keep a dialogue, you keep a dialogue for what? You, you are trying to look for a way of living next to each other peacefully and, and also to have a durable and, and sensible, agreeable solution to how to live to next other. So a modus vivendi. But how can we have such a one? Because they, when you look at their policy where, and uh, their undesirability to, to actually compromise on anything, I even wonder if anything would be acceptable to Russia that goes under clear military domination in the Baltic theater and so on. They would not agree to a stalemate or anything like that, which wouldn't allow us to be a threat to them, but also them to be a threat to us. So uh, they won't agree to that. So they clearly want to dominate and to be a threat, because that's the only way they feel good, when uh, the countries around uh, feel threatened and have uh, day by day to, to, to take care that uh, Russia would not attack them or, 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 or threaten them. So th this would be my answer. Thank you. Yes, uh, it's a very important question, actually. Uh, and uh, if we look back to the last 20 years uh, in NATO-Russia relations, then NATO has done everything, every possible step to show that we are defense alliance, we don't have any any kind of ideas to somehow pressure Russia offensively and uh, somehow make Russia feel that uh, NATO poses danger to to existence of Russian Federation. Take, uh, for instance, uh, NATO-Russia Founding Act from 97, plus many, many other uh, initiatives up to the very latest times where NATO members 
you know, obviously would like to see much less uh, tense uh, relationship with, uh, with Russia. Uh, think about INF issue, uh, think about uh, many other topics. But Estonia is it first in line to have normal, predictable, peaceful relations with, uh, with Russia. And I, I think this is the same uh, goes with uh, any other NATO member state. But what we see, as I said earlier, is that uh, from strategies, from actually early 90s, and we, we misguide ourselves when we think that something in the 90s, the Russian thinking totally changed and this is new country and there is no Cold War anymore. There is Cold War. Cold War is going on right now. Probably in, in real terms, never stopped in terms of spying, in terms of hybrid threats and something like that. But today, Russia is more dangerous than Soviet Union was in the 80s. And this is why we have to really first and foremost understand it and then don't make any illusions that there is a kind of open doors today existing that through dialogue we can change uh, the situation. We, yes, of course, diplomacy existing always and diplomacy has a important role as diplomats know uh, very well about that. But uh, at the same time, you have to show strength and this is what matters talking with Russia. Paul, you had some. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, thankfully, I'm, as a soldier, I don't have to do too much. I can leave the discussion to diplomats and politicians. Um, but I think on a daily basis, I think we are talking to, to Russia by our activities that are going on in this country and in the Baltics. It's quite clearly that they are observing what's going on and we send that message of a tight, close alliance on a daily basis. Um, and so that needs to continue. The difficult balance is, is to make sure that we maintain... Let that go past. That we maintain the, the fact that we are a defensive alliance uh, and that we don't look like we're being provocative by escalating our activities and making sure that we are giving that clear message, that we're tied together but in a defensive posture. Exactly, and I think the key word is also you know, the transparency you know, as much as possible. And I think the battle group and you know, EFP deployment here is actually, also, I think, a good example that I think NATO and the Allies have been, you know, to my personal surprise, you know, very, very you know, the open, transparent about you know, all this, you know, the mission, what it contains, what are the you know, numbers, figures, you know, the, the material at SR here. So I think it's probably all known also to, <laughs> to, to other sides. So that to be you know, trust, trustworthy and, and you know, transparent on this, yeah. I'll, I will just comment a little bit my personal experience, especially you know, as, as is what mentioned before, that uh, in NATO there is a different perspective on threat assessments and understanding what these you know, and what the aims are of the Russia and so on and so forth. The thing is that when I was meeting with their, my you know, British colleagues or you know, American colleagues or, or any other country, we talked about those topics. And of course, they were like, oh, you might be a little bit um, paranoid. Uh, is it real or not? But after you know, hours and hours and days and days and after five years, I think everybody understood why we are thinking like that. And, and this, this is the thing why I think the forces here are really good you know, example that when we talk each other, when we explain why we feel, what we feel, uh, how we can perceive certain actions and, you know, others, um, it helps a lot. And, and everything happens with the personal relationships. I, I personally truly believe that. And even though they might not believe uh, what we are believing or understanding, but they are behind us in, in the way. And this is a solidarity and this is the unity. And I think that one of the things what NATO have done greatly is that uh, we have stayed together even when we don't 100% sometimes feel the same. Yeah. Okay, it's now again time to ask questions from the audience. Please raise your hands if you have got some questions. While you think, if I may bring maybe another a topic for uh, for debate and as you know this year's opinion festival's overall theme is the sustainable development and the and the future i'd like to ask actually how green is nato or how green are our uh, militaries and you know seriously i mean obviously when you have the situation of the conflict that may not be the first topic in your mind but i'm aware that actually the the militaries and the allies have you know, paid attention uh, to this so maybe not going as far as in the civilian life that no plastic used or uh, etc but but paul could you a little bit elaborate is this 
something goes in your mind when you also exercise here or plan your activities, do you think about you know, the, the footprint you have on Estonian environments when you, while you are present here? <laughs> Thank you. Um, we obviously, when we're exercising, the same with the, the Estonian Defence Force, we are absolutely concerned with the, the natural habitat and environment. And you could see by the, the way that we were exercising in, in the spring, uh, there was a lot of thought, care and attention to make sure that we, we aren't damaging the habitat and wildlife, etc., and the environment. Um, as far as our, I suppose, our green element, we use an awful lot of fuel. We're, we're a big beast to be, to, to be operating. Um, but there are always uh, innovations that can be done as far as using so, solar electricity, uh, solar power, et cetera, to generate uh, for radio recharging, et cetera, that can be done and improved on. And those are being looked at. Maybe not necessarily at the pace that, uh, that some of our more green elements would like it to happen, but it is, it is going on. Oh, no, this is obviously also a question for you. So you have this combined knowledge of the both, you know, the, the military industry and now the, you know, the renewable energy sector. Do we see, I don't know, solar or the wind-powered mm. tanks in the future or uh, what's the future to hold for us? Uh, thank you for, for the question, of course. Um, and I, I was not prepared on, to answer that question. But uh, indeed, I'm, I have to say that I'm quite proud uh, to Estonian forces and our commander, uh, Martin Herem, uh, simply because we, I, I think I was uh, in my new job two or two weeks, I think, and he asked me to meet up and, uh, and we started to have a discussion about how to turn the army greener uh, and make the change and what's the possibilities and so on and so forth. And uh, after the short discussion and, and great initiative, uh, we are working on it at the moment uh, with lots of partners trying to figure it out, what's the possibilities and so on and so forth. Absolutely, they have the heavy impact um, in, in exercises, but also everyday use. There is lots of electricity needed, lots of uh, water, your warm water. Uh, and, and those things have to be uh, changed. But on the other hand, also, it comes from the leaders. And, and this time, I have to say that, uh, indeed, uh, the mentality shift, I think, in the politicians, but also in the army and everybody else is, is coming and is there. So I'm, again, in um, in exciting time, in exciting place, I have to say, that, uh, that uh, people are ready to face uh, the change uh, and accept it that uh, certain uh, impact have to decreased and, and we have other options also available already. The technology has changed heavily. It's much cheaper now than it was before. Uh, there is uh, people will and, and, and companies there, so uh, now it just needs to be done. Yeah, just just to, to, to point out, we also we operate within the constraints that every other big industry works in within uh, within Europe. You know, so we can't exceed the, the, uh, any of the the rules and regulations that are that are already in place. So we, we live within those constraints. Yeah, Marco. Politically speaking, I mean, uh, when you also you know the look at you know the Estonian you know defence uh, development plan and and the budget, does this aspect come to your mind when you discuss in Parliament the development <laughs> of Estonian <laughs> Actually, armed forces? I'm, I'm entirely honest. I, I hear first time this kind of uh, angle, but uh, I just but invented the question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but this is good. This is, uh, tells us uh, actually that we, we I, I, I'm 100% I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, technology uh, development uh, is, uh, is there and uh, it uh, can't go, uh, you know, not touching uh, also the military sphere. So, but just my per personal uh, experience as a reserve officer, I participated. Uh, two years ago at our Hedgehog uh, big uh, exercise and I was CIMIC uh, officer in south of Estonia. And actually, uh, I must say that as every single Estonian soldier and officer knows how important uh, forest is for us, uh, then uh, the care uh, what is taken during exercises and also after cleaning up uh, is, uh, I must say, uh, fantastic. And, uh, and this is uh, the, the cooperation with uh, environmental protection uh, units as well is, is always there during uh, exercises, bigger and smaller. Very glad to hear. Yeah. A couple of words maybe uh, that I think too, um, according to my own experience and contacts with the military, that um, a green mindset is, is there. 
is becoming more stronger. It's not just the uniforms of the army, mostly are green, and, and the environment they train in is green, so, but the mines also become greener in that sense. And of course, uh, uh, very much is done through simulations and so on these days, and, but there are limits to that because the military, they also need uh, life and, and field exercises. So it's, it's not possible to do it all by computers and simulates. So. But then they, they would take care, obviously, of the environment. I would but say. what is also quite unique, you can actually tell us, is this uh, sort of only a stoning gaze, but, uh, but still uh, during exercises, we see that these are not going on only in restricted areas, I mean, in polygons, uh, closed areas, but uh, on the streets of our uh, cities, like this year in Silama, last uh, two years ago in Valga, when uh, British tanks attacked uh, uh, adversaries, uh, and the people were out, and, you know, all were, everybody were very kind of happy to see that uh, was what's going on. I, I don't think that this is something could easily be... Uh, carried out in some British village, you know, or maybe, I don't know. Uh, no, uh, we, don't, <laughs> we, we don't routinely in UK exercise as widely on, on uh, public land and, and private land as, as I've seen here. Uh, and I think it's really good. I think it shows, one, it's uh, the, the, the relationship between the military and the Estonian people is really strong, that they'll allow that to, to go on. I think that's really good. Uh, and two, I think it provides a really good, well, I think it does, I think it provides a really good reassurance effect to the population that they see that the forces are there, they're capable, they're pro professional, and that they do their daily business in a really good way, uh, looking after the environment, looking after the people that they're around them. And uh, I think that's impressive. Okay, I think this would be now your last chance to ask some questions from the panelists. Yes, please, I see one question there. Could you please help with Mike? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I don't know how far you would agree with my assessment, but I see one of the most important purposes of NATO as finding the, that delicate balance between uh, deterrence and de-escalation. So going forward, let's say a few decades, uh, what would you say is probably the most important aspect in maintaining that balance, or should there be a focus on either or? Well, maybe. De deterrence and de-escalation, they are not exclusive, or uh, I mean, they, they are intertwined. And um, as, as I said before, we, we witness now a continuous policy of escalation by Russia on purpose. Uh, they obviously would uh, always justify their steps uh, with what we do in, in, in self-defense. Um, we um, do everything in terms of as, as much as we can in terms of transparency. Uh, they've been visiting uh, the uh, EFP contingent in Tapa at least twice, I think. They've seen British tanks, French tanks, artillery, whatever they, they would like to see, they've seen them. What we see from the Russian side is basically secrecy, try to surprise us, to provoke. Um, I, I would bring you, I don't know, a long sequence of, of, of uh, ways Russia provokes us. Uh, for instance, by um, um, violating our airspace and that of allies, which is a means, a political means, to show that our sovereignty doesn't matter to them. Um, they would intrude even into zones designated for NATO exercises, as they've done in the Black Sea now in July. They would uh, do many, I mean, they would jam um, our, the GPS and m mobile communication systems when we have exercises one, or when they have exercises. Um, they, they would simulate nuclear attacks even against uh, Stockholm or, or Warsaw and the Borholm Island and so on. Now imagine the other way around. If NATO would finish an exercise in the Baltic Sea simulating a nuclear strike on St. Petersburg, for instance. That would be taken by Russia as a clear declaration of war, I don't know what. So, while Russia behaves like that, it should be taken as normal, so to say, and, and so on. But, uh, of course, we would never go that way down and start playing Russia's game. That's clear. So, we, 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 do, we play our game as we do it. It's fair, it's clear, it's, it's transparent. 
And if they want to escalate further, they would do it, whatever we do or we do not do. Because, as I said, probably they just want to show that they are irritated, that we don't take them, so to say, seriously, and, and they don't have always perhaps a place at the table as they would like to, and to show that they are dominant in their neighborhood, whatever we do about it. So this, this is their purpose. And in this sense, Russia can only de-escalate herself, if, if she chooses to. So, and um, that's my answer. I don't know. No, any additions? So, Marco, no. Well, it's business as usual. So, uh, as we said, that uh, 70 years matured us uh, and gave us a lot of uh, experience. Uh, to avoid stupid mistakes from our side and uh, keep going. And uh, deterrence is something what is strongly back in the vocabulary of uh, NATO, NATO's politicians and uh, this is what works. That's it. And this helps de-escalate situations. Okay. Do I see any further questions? If that's not the case, I would like to thank the, the organizers for this possibility to have this panel, definitely also all the panelists here, and, and also you, you know, for having an interest and posing you know, a really, really good question. So thank you very much, and maybe applause is due to the panelists. Sir. Thank you. 